Hello and welcome to episode two of In Suspense, a brand new video podcast for fans and writers of crime fiction, brought to you by me, Leslie Cara, and my delightful co-host, Lauren North. Uh, I don't know how long we'll be able to call ourselves brand new, Laurie. I mean, maybe maybe for a few more episodes, perhaps? I don't know. Yeah, or a few series, I'm not sure. Uh, I, I still, I, maybe when we don't feel quite like it's all new and nervous and we're trying to figure everything out, then maybe yeah. then it's not new and we're just yeah. the old podcast. That's right. I was thinking maybe season two, we could, we could call ourselves a new video podcast and then yeah. maybe season three, if we're still here, if we haven't been you know, kicked off the airwaves for incompetence. <laughs> then, no, uh, incontinence, incompetence. <laughs> then we can just call ourselves a video podcast or vodcast. I mean, I've heard that some oh. people are calling them vodcasts. Have you heard of that? Yeah, I think that's very close to vodka. So I might get myself confused with that one. So <laughs> yeah. maybe, maybe video podcast is okay. I was thinking about that. I was thinking vodka sounds as if it should be said with a, with, with a Russian accent, doesn't it? Vodka. Yes. It does, <laughs> subscribe yeah. to our podcast <laughs> yeah sorry about that uh, little russian moment everybody but uh, no so we episode two already i mean we've been really really thrilled with the response so far i think you've got some of the the stats haven't you laurie yeah i am so thrilled we have had in the first week over 100 views slash listens which has been absolutely fantastic and they can't all have been my mum <laughs> So um, I'm really pleased. So thank you if you are one of the people who have listened so far. Um, we're really delighted and we've really loved um, hearing how people have been enjoying it and getting that feedback. Oh. It's been great. It's, it's out on um, YouTube now and Spotify and the Apple podcast directory as well. So there's quite a lot of different ones as well as you can listen to it directly on our website, which is in-suspense.co.uk. There's lots of ways to listen. So exciting. Brilliant. Yeah, that's really exciting. And uh, so the topic for this week is the enduring popularity of the psychological thriller. Mm. And uh, so, I mean, I don't know what, what you think about this, Laurie, but I, I was thinking about this. And I, my view is that because the psychological thriller tends to be set in a sort of environment that we're very familiar with, you know, often it's the home or, or you know, the domestic setting or it could be the workplace or the commute to work, you know, the girl on the train. Yeah. Um, and characters that, you know, are we can easily identify. They're ordinary people, um, as opposed to sort of like a high octane thriller where you've got lots of car chases and, you know, spy thrillers and shoot 'em dead type of books, you know, where it's the action is so far removed from our everyday lives that although we enjoy them, we can't really closely identify with them. So I, I think their appeal is that there's, there's that emotional intensity, you know, you, and they're often written in the first person. So mm. you can really, really, you know, identify with the character and, and feel what they're going through. And it's, it's kind of, you know, often they're exploring our darkest fears, aren't they? Like, who can we trust? And uh, the people we love are the people we're closest to. Can, can we really, do we really know them at all? So, you know, I, I think there are, those are some of the reasons that it's... Yeah, I think that's really interesting. So you think that because it's quite close to home for people, then that's, you think they're helping to identify with it? Yeah, I think that's one of the reasons, possibly, because we don't, you know, we've evolved in the sense that we don't... Most of us are lucky. Well, I know some people obviously do live in very dangerous situations, particularly in the home, a lot of women particularly, but most of us maybe don't have that danger in our lives so maybe it's a way of living vicariously and and sort of experiencing that adrenaline rush that we we don't get otherwise yeah that's true and i certainly really enjoy writing my characters who are i try and see as ordinary people and putting them in horrible situations so i can see what you're saying there i think you're right actually that close to home feeling mm. that um intensity definitely and and I think also, I mean, they're like we we like a puzzle to solve, don't we? Mm. I mean, if you read detective fiction, obviously you're you're going along with the detective and you're getting clues and that's being sort of explained as you go along and you're you're trying to solve the puzzle before the detective does. But in psychological thrillers, you're you're just thrown into the action, aren't you? And you're piecing together all the bits and wondering what's going to happen. And 
I think it's, you know, if you if you manage to guess what's going on before the big reveal, that's really gratifying because you feel, oh, yeah, I've, I've worked it out. And then even if you don't work it out, it's and it's a real surprise. That's still gratifying because you can think, oh, my God, yes, of course. Oh, they got me. Yeah, you got me. Yeah. That's exciting, isn't it? But, uh, I, I mean, think about, um, yeah, they've always I didn't think about. I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I keep cutting you off. Oh, no, what are we doing? Um, I um, think that um, I didn't think about the setting at all. For me, what I really thought the enduring popularity of the psychological thriller was coming from um, the fact that you get so much in those novels because you've got, as you said, this emotional intensity and depth to the characters. But you've also got this pace and tension that's dragging you through this book. And I just feel like it's one of those genres where you can really cram so much into it. And I think there's just there's so much to get out of it. So that it's such a broad readership of people yes. who enjoy those books, I think. Yes. And they've, you know, a lot of people sort of seem to think it's a relatively recent trend, but it isn't, is it? You know, we've always yeah. loved, I mean, when we, we've always loved these books. I mean, when was Rebecca written? It was in the third. Exactly. That was the, the that was the one that popped to my mind. Exactly that. Yeah. And so I think, you know, they're, they're obviously, they are, they are, they are having their moment or they're still having their moment. It's a long old moment, isn't it? Well, let's think... hope that moment continues okay. a little bit longer or we're going to be in big trouble. <laughs> we'll have to switch genres if that moment yeah. ends. <laughs> I just dust off my science fiction knowledge. <laughs> Actually, that's really interesting. If you could write in another genre, Leslie, what would you write in? Ooh. Well, when I started, first of all, writing, I was writing sort of um, comic sort of fiction. Oh, um, really? Yeah. I, um, I was writing from the point of view of a... I think it, I was writing from the point of view of a very dis dissatisfied, cynical lecturer in further education, probably because I was... Not autobiographical, though. <laughs> dissatisfied cynical lecturer in FE so uh, yeah so I tried to write comic fiction but um, I remember I remember going to one of those pitch and agent days Do you, you know those things oh yeah I've done them yeah oh god and, you, and I, I remember trying to pitch my novel in front of this agent and telling him it was a it was a you know a, a comic novel and he sort of immediately started you know his eyes glazed over he started shaking his head he said oh no 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 he said I'm, I'm not interested in um, comic oh. novels because humor is so subjective subjective I you know and so then I in my desperation said oh well it's it's not that funny <laughs> which, which is really not the kind of thing to say when you're pitching a comic novel to an agent just don't no, tell I, I think no I think that's a good a good one to do yeah I can see you writing actually like a literary style humorous book actually I think I, I would like to one day maybe but we'll we'll see I'm, I've, I've got I've got to got to write another one <laughs> in, in the yeah, when there's time, I, love, yeah. I love I love writing in this uh, genre actually I yeah really... me too actually yeah I really do and I do think there's so many different sub-genres to it as well you know you've got these like the missing children you know is it the husband kind of ones and there's so many um the serial killers um and all these sort of slightly newer sub-genres come out where like you're getting different points of view from like the different um a lot of the times it can be from suddenly um like the serial killer's point of view and yes. it's all all rising up still i think there's still a lot more to come from this genre i think definitely someone who might know a bit about that would be our first guest on the in suspense podcast which is sj watson hey Hello and welcome SJ Watson. You are our first guest on In Suspense and we're delighted to have you here. So hello. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to be here. Great pleasure. It's a great honour for us actually to have you. <laughs> yes, um, it is. Thank you. And uh, nice top, by the way. I, uh, I, I, it, <laughs> Steve emailed me a few minutes ago just to check that it was audio only. So goodness knows what he'd have been wearing if I hadn't I'd put got on a white that didn't really fit and I'd still got it down. <laughs> So. Yeah, you look very smart so uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> so i'm going to introduce you properly and formally because you know you are a legendary guest so i want to do it properly so um sj watson's first novel before i go to sleep was a phenomenal international success and has now sold over six million copies six million worldwide <laughs> it's staggering isn't it yeah, my mom bought many of them though to be honest <laughs> <laughs> 
and he's very modest as well. <laughs> uh, it won the Crime Writers Association Award for Best Debut Novel and the Galaxy National Book Award for Crime Thriller of the Year and has been translated into more than 40 languages. The film of the book, starring Nicole Kidman, Colin Firth and Mark Strong, and directed by Rowan Joffe, I think that's how you pronounce it, was released in September 2014. S.J. Watson's second novel, Second Life, also a psychological thriller, was published to acclaim in 2015, and his latest, Final Cut, which Laurie and I have both read and loved, was published to rave reviews in August 2020. So welcome, S.J. Watson, or Steve, as I think we will probably call you from now on. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Thank you for that lovely introduction as well. You use the word legendary, which I always approve of. So. Well, you are legendary. <laughs> <laughs> So I think, Laurie, you're going to start off the questioning, aren't you? I am. So the interrogation. My, <laughs> my first question is, um, I don't know if you've heard this, but Elizabeth Gilbert, who wrote Eat, Pray, Sleep, I'm sorry, Eat, Pray, Love, she um, talks very openly about wanting to quit after her success with Eat, Pray, Love and how she really struggled to feel like she was um, writing a, the next book that was and pleasing both the fans and the critics mm. and she felt like it was really stifling her creativity and I wondered how your experience was after all of your phenomenal success with Before I Go to Sleep. So that's my question. Yeah no it's an interesting one isn't it? I hadn't read the um, Elizabeth Gilbert quote but uh, Elizabeth Gilbert yeah uh, but yes. It, yes it make but it does make total sense. I, it's kind of a strange thing because um, you know I think I think it's actually Stephen King who said something like, you need to write the first draft with the door closed and the second draft with the door open. And, I've, and you know, what I understand by that, or what I think about that is, you know, you've got to write the first draft certainly for yourself before you start to even really think about um, um, who's going to be reading it, I suppose. And I think, you know, when you're writing your debut or your first book, uh, I don't know if you'd agree, but I think it's kind of, it's very easy to do that because the chances are no one is going to read it. You know, it's very easy to convince yourself it's just for you. Um, so that was kind of an easy thing. But then when it when it when I came to sort of sit and write my second book, I mean, I thought I was handling it all very well and everything was you know fine. And all these people who complain about second book pressure, what are they talking about? But actually, when I came to sit down and write it, it was it was kind of strange because it becomes very difficult to keep that door closed, to keep to keep your it to yourself, and to to sort of think about writing it just for yourself because. You know, I've got, and this is a luxury problem to have. I'm not, I'm, I don't want to sound like I'm complaining because it is a great problem for all the problems that you can have. It's, it's not a bad one, you know, following up a hugely successful debut novel that's changed your life and, you know, had <laughs> been turned into filming Nicole Kidman. I mean, it's great. But it does mean when, when I sat down to write, suddenly I'd got all these other voices and all these other opinions to take into account. You know, I'd got an agent, I'd got editors, and more importantly, I'd got readers all over the world. You know, Leslie mentioned six million, but, you know, I'm sure at least a percentage of those were going to be interested in what I was doing, you know. And so, yeah, it, it did become difficult. I mean, back back with Before I Go to Sleep, I was I was reading, you know, Amazon reviews and things. I don't do any more because it's not a healthy thing, I don't think. But back then I was, you know, it's my first book. I wanted to know what people thought of it and was excited. And, you know, they were generally positive. So, but I remember somebody once reviewed it saying something like, um, you know, we've all got those crutch phrases that we use, you know, my, my characters shake their heads all the time and I have to go through, I have to do a, I have to do a whole edit of removing the shakings of the head and, and the, but this, this person had said, you know, that my characters turn, what well, something like they turn to each other so often in this book, it's a wonder they're not dizzy because I'd really, that's another one of my crutch, crutch phrases kind of, you know. Um, he turned to her, she turned to him and something. So I just, you know, I, I noticed that when I was writing my second book, when I sat down to write Second Life, every time I was about to type in, he turned to her or she turned to him, I was thinking, oh no, I have to stop this because Mrs. Smith in Hartlepool thinks it's a terrible <laughs> idea, you know. And so, um, yeah, so I did become slightly, I think my journey with the second, sorry, this is a much longer answer than you probably No, no, that's okay. No, it's great. <laughs> I think kind of my journey with writing the second book was actually to learn how to get back to that place of creativity and actually to, to certainly with the first draft, to not really think about who was going to be reading it. Mm. Um, because I think, you know, when you're rewriting and when you're working on the second and third and so on drafts, that's when you can start to think, okay, what's the reader going to be thinking? Are they going to like this? Are they not going to like it? Mm. Um, how, can, how can I make this better? But I think if you, the first draft should come from a place of, 
I don't know. I hesitate to use the word purity, but it works as well as anything else. It's kind of, yeah, this place mm. within yourself. So um, did, did, did you always want to be a writer, Steve? I mean, how, yeah. you know, have, are there sort of, you know, mounds of unpublished um, novels festering in the bottom of a wardrobe somewhere? <laughs> well, festering would probably be a good way. Not mounds <laughs> of them, no. Um, I mean, yeah, I've always wanted to write. I've always, I've always scribbled to a greater or lesser extent and taken it more or less seriously over the years. You know, there been there were some periods where I was, you know, I would sit down and try to write a novel and then and then give up and or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I began to take it, I suppose, properly seriously. Maybe nearly fifteen years ago now, I suppose. But it, but even, but for all my life before then, it had been it had been a thing that I, it was, but it was more of a hobby, I suppose. It was something I sort of dabbled in. Mm-hmm. Quite funny actually. I remember uh, with before I go to sleep. I did an interview with, I think it was the Washington Post, so it was a, new, a, a big American newspaper anyway. And um, they're very big on fact checking over there, aren't they? Which I hadn't kind of come across before. So when I'd done the interview, I'd said something like, I'd been asked a very similar question and I'd said, oh yeah, I've got, I've got a few, I've, I started a few novels and gave them, and gave them up before I, um, before I began, before I go to sleep. Um, and uh, that went fine in the interview. And then the fa- before it was published, the fact checker, the legal team, I suppose. Although I'm not going to sue myself. I mean, I, I <laughs> anyway, the legal team called me up and said, okay, we've got it here. It says a few. I mean, how many is a few? And I was like, I don't know, just a few novels, just a few. And she went, what is it, like 50? I was like, no, it's not 50. And she went, what is it, five? I said, well, it might be more than five. And we kind of did this ridiculous bartering so eventually we settled on 20 and then it was printed in the newspaper that I had, I had that before I guess it was my 21st novel and I'd written 20 that I'd abandoned, which is not true at all. How bizarre. Uh, yes, I have 20 novels in my <laughs> festering in a drawer. <laughs> and, then, and then you did the Faber Academy course as well, didn't you? Yeah. I think you did the yeah. first one, didn't you? I, yeah, I did the first six month yeah, course, yeah. yeah. Uh, which was a, you know, it was a great, I mean, it was exactly right for me. It was a great experience. It was what I needed at that time. Mm. Um, you know, so, so yeah, it was a wonderful experience. I mean, I was very lucky because I think there were only six of us, six students in my group. So it was, it was like, you know, it wasn't one-to-one, obviously. It was, mm. but it was, you know, much, much more so than the bigger groups that came later. Yes, because I, I think I did it in 2012, and there were there were 15 of us. So yeah, mm. it was, but yeah. it, it it gained in popularity then, largely yeah. because of your success. I yeah. think. <laughs> well, we have maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so did you? Um, has, has the speed of your novel writing process changed from like how long it took you to write before I go to sleep and final cut? Uh, yes, it ha- I mean yes and no. Actually, thinking about it. Um, Second Life took me a long time. And I think it was because of all the things we've talked about, you know, in terms of suddenly the pressure and the other voices and trying to mm. find the place of stillness and everything like that. Um, and also, I think looking back, I was kind of very distracted by the film. I didn't have anything to do with the film, really, in, in, in a formal way. I didn't write the script or anything like that. Um, but I did, I did get very uh, swept along on the excitement of it, I suppose. I bet. And, and looking back now, I, I couldn't really, looking back on that period, I couldn't really settle, I don't think, on Second Life or settle down to really work hard on it. Well, no, I was working hard, but fo- maybe focus on it is the better way of putting it, until the film was done. It was, although, I, again, I didn't really realise that at the time, but looking back now, I think the film had really sort of distracted me. Um, so Second Life took a long time. And, um, you know, and I thought, oh, that's my process. And, actual, and actually, Final Cut, though, um, it was really, it was written in, it was probably almost as quick as before I go to sleep because, which took me a year basically. But the problem there was that I, I trashed a novel between, um, Second Life and Final Cut. So I, I finished a book and then decided that it wasn't mm. what I wanted to put out into the world. It was very, um, and I think I'm known for dark. <laughs> I think my stuff, my stuff is quite dark. It's not kind of, you know, there's not going to be a musical of before I go to sleep, let's face it. You know. um, well, that's not a bad idea. That's, anyway, quite no. a, that's quite a brave thing to do, isn't it? To ditch yeah, a novel. I mean, yeah, I mean, it was, it was too dark. It, was, it wasn't, and it wasn't, it wasn't dark in a good way, I don't think, if that makes sense. It was a bit, I, anyway, and also it just didn't really feel like something I wanted to put out into the world. 
it's kind of strange. I, I sort of had a bit of a weird epiphany in the, in the foils on Tottenham Court Road. I love that shop, you know, it's kind of, oh, it's almost like being in some kind of church, isn't it? Kind of really? huge, you know, surrounded by these books. You can look all the way up to the you know, ceiling. And, and I just thought there were so many books in the world. And, and if I'm going to put one out and ask people to pay, you know, between seven and 12 pounds or whatever to, to, to read it, then I have to be absolutely, you know, a hundred percent proud of it. So, yeah. yeah so, uh, so that went in the bin. Yeah. So, mm. so that's why. So, so to answer your question, yeah. So my my writing, it kind of second life was the was the outlier, and it took me a long time before I go to sleep and final cut. Probably took me about the same amount of time, but there is a long gap between books two and three because mm -hmm. of the one I mm -hmm. hitched. So final cut. Do you um, want to? Um, and on that note. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> It's my fault because I jumped in with an extra question that we had <laughs> planned. Um, on that note, do you want to tell us about um, Final Cut and um, what, what the book's about? Because Leslie and I have obviously both read it and loved yeah. it. Or the layers of suspicion and just the sinisterness of it was amazing. But do you want to um, give the, um, the listeners a bit of a... You know, every time I get asked this question, I think I really should. I really should spend twenty minutes working on my on my elevator pitch, and I <laughs> do it. It's on my to do list. So yeah, so Final Cut follows the story of a film, a young documentary filmmaker called Alex, who wants to follow up her very successful first film by um, by really sort of composing or making a film um, based on uh, of people's everyday, ordinary everyday life in a, in a fishing village in the north of England. And she wants to make this film in a slightly unusual way by piecing together footage that other people have shot, that the, vi that the villagers themselves have shot. But um, she goes up there to uh, sort of manage the film, I suppose, and to meet the people who are submitting their films, the videos, and discovers that something sinister is going on in the village that seems to involve uh, two... Uh, girls, young girls who've gone missing over the last 10 years or so, and in particular one called Daisy, who apparently took her own life, but there is a big question mark because her body was never found. There is a big question mark about whether it was in fact suicide. So Alex finds herself being drawn into that mystery and realises that there's more to her involvement than she might have realised. Well, I think you've you've summarised that very well, and obviously it's, it's really difficult. Journey, though, perhaps. It's really hard to uh, to give a blurb for a psychological thriller, isn't it? Because well, you yeah, have I mean, to be so careful. Yeah, I mean, it's rather, rather well, I can say stupidly, but you know, it wasn't it was deliberate. But the first twist in this book, as you both know, comes quite early on, which means mm. there's not a lot I can <laughs> there's not a lot I can talk about. So, <laughs> without giving something away, it's quite difficult. Um, but yeah. And uh, because, you know, documentary filmmaking plays such a big part in the novel, and I, we've noticed that you've been, you put out a lot of your own little films on, on yeah. YouTube that are really they're great. They're such fun to watch and they're really interesting. So I was wondering whether, you know, filmmaking has always been a, an interest of yours or a hobby or whether it's something you've had to research in order to, to write the novel. Um, it was. It's always been an interest, I suppose, but but as a viewer, not as a filmmaker. I've always, mm. I've always, and even then, I wouldn't say I'm a particularly sophisticated viewer of films. I mean, I you know, I don't, I don't sort of analyse them as I'm watching them. I you know, I, I end up just sitting there like everybody else and munching on popcorn and whatever. Um, but I do enjoy film, and I and I have I have enjoyed more and more documentaries actually lately. So I think it's it probably partly came out of that. Mm. I mean, the book was was sort of triggered by two two documentaries in particular one of which was a film that came out a few years ago called life in a day um that was made by inviting people all over the world to submit footage of their everyday life but on a particular saturday in july i think it was in 2015 or something um and that that kind of fascinated me because it was a really interesting kind of study and it was really well put together so for example you had footage of some poor kid in South America who who had literally had nothing apart from what he had in his pockets and he didn't have anything in his pockets really you know and mm -hmm. kind of had a and then it's cut to some guy in the in the states who was waving the keys of his Ferrari you know and, sort of, mm -hmm. and it just really showed the disparity um and 
and it, but also it was a really great sort of snapshot of humanity I think on one particular day so I sort of took took that in a way and, and ran with it and sort of inverted it almost and said well how, well how about if we just make it about a one geographical location but spread out over time instead um and then the other one was what I really I, I think it's a really sweet film that I well sweet perhaps isn't quite the right word but anyway a really great film called Three Salons at the Seaside which is um on the surface, it's a documentary about women in the north of England. Getting, it's, it's from the early 80s, I think. It's a documentary about women in the north of England getting their shampoo and set, you know, every week and sort of gossiping about their husbands and stuff, you know, and what's happening. And But, of course, really, it's about, again, it's about everyday life and the dramas and the, and the tragedies and so on. So I found that really gripping as well. And I've been really watching a lot of true crime documentaries as well. Mm. Um, I'm always really struck by them about the way that there is stuff, and I'm sure you, as novelists you appreciate this, but the way that there is stuff in true crime documentaries that you think, if I tried to put that in a book, my editor would say, you, you would never get away with that. No one's ever going to believe that would happen. Yeah. Well, you need to make it, you know, and actually, but it does happen. It's the cliche truth being stranger than fiction. So I think in a way I was kind of with this book sort of thinking, well, if I make it a film, about a documentary filmmaker maybe i can get away with it like that i could put more more freaky stuff in or more you know more realistic stuff in actually um so yeah so it kind of came from that but and the, the stuff that i've been doing i think partly was driven through a sense of like when a book comes out i really enjoyed the process of because it's such a solitary endeavor isn't it writing it you is in your room with imaginary people uh, for, for hour after hour day after day um and so yeah. I, I always, I do quite like the getting out there and meeting people and sort of doing signings and book tours and events and things. And of course that's not been happening this year. No. But I think partly it was a way of kind of fulfilling that need that I had to kind of connect and to talk about the things around the book. And I think it's really helpful because, you know, you, 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 you do a sort of video diary, don't you, of how you've, you've yeah, written, written the book. And that's really helpful for new writers and, you know, would-be writers because they can see, you know, how, how difficult yeah. a process it is and how sometimes yeah. you don't feel in the mood for writing and you have yeah. to just sort of galvanise yourself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Wait till the next episode. I had a really bad day on Monday. It was like, it's funny because like I was like, I just, I didn't really want to do the diary either. I, <laughs> Because I'm not, I'm not doing it every day. I'm just doing it when it kind of, I feel like I've got something to, interesting or to say or a particularly yeah. interesting stage. And I, on Monday, I didn't, I just really, really didn't want to do any work. It was really kind of like, the, and I thought, this is what I should be recording. Because as, as, like you say, I think, I think a lot of people who are aspiring novelists or very early on in their journey, kind of probably, like I did, probably imagine that people who've been published, it just comes easy that you just sit down at a desk and open your computer or your notepad or whatever. And streams of beautiful, brilliant pose, prose just pour out onto the page and then you, and then you sit there in a smoking jacket. If only. If, exactly, exactly, but it's like, it, it doesn't, and, and the sad thing, I think I was, I think, I don't know, I, I sort of got the impression, or, or I came to believe anyway, that when Before I Go to Sleep was published, never mind, then went on to its huge success. I think I was guilty also of sort of thing, well, I can write now. I've learned, mm. I've learned how to write books. Mm. And all I need to do is just do that again. It's like riding a bike. You don't forget, you know, you don't forget how to ride a bike. You, no, you know, I I can, and, but actually what I realised, I don't know if you'd agree, but you learn how to write the book that you're writing. And then yeah. it's not quite back to square one, hopefully, because you take stuff with you. But every book requires a different sort of... Yes, I agree. Oh, it never gets easier, does it? It just no. it's a different sort of hard, you know, you just you just as you say, each novel is yeah. you can't compare it to the one that went before. And 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 sometimes, you know, what worked in terms of planning a novel previously doesn't yeah. work this time. So, you know, you might have been a planner or a pantser or whatever mm -hmm. and you do some, something a different way, it works differently. Absolutely, it, and that's exactly what's happened with me actually. I mean, with before before I go to sleep was very much well, yeah, it was pretty much pants. It was kind of, I knew the beginning, obviously. Well, not obviously, I knew the beginning. I knew the opening scene. And then I knew that without, I mean, because there are still some people who haven't read it, but I won't give it away. But I knew the truth. I knew the twist. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know anything else. I didn't know how we were going to get from A to B or A to Z or whatever. And, and so I thought, oh, that's, you know, I just pantsed it all the way. And, um, but yeah, now I'm becoming more and more of a planner. I'm actually really quite enjoying it. I shouldn't say, yeah, no, why not? I'm really quite enjoying it. <laughs> Well, you're a good company because Laurie's a yeah. great planner. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, really big planner. Um, and I totally agree with what you're saying about learning a new book because I think it's the characters. Because in our genre, mm -hmm. the characters are so critical. You've got to get their depth. So when you start writing a new book, you're really learning they're learning about them aren't you so i think yeah. yeah for me i'm crazy planner love a love a spreadsheet in word not excel i'm not not that crazy um, oh, i'm not crazy i'm i mean i'm in <laughs> excel now right. oh <laughs> excel <laughs> um but ask i'm um, talking about um characters when i was reading final cut um the setting of um of the novel is so intense and it feels almost like a character in itself it's mm. very creepy and dark and, and plays such a huge role in the novel and can you can you tell us a little bit about the setting it's based on a sort of a real place is it yeah it's 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 fictional the it's the final cut is set in a fictional place called blackwood bay but blackwood bay is very much based on a real place called robin hood's bay which is in north yorkshire and uh I didn't want to set it in the real place for several reasons, but the biggest one was, as you know, having read it, there, there aren't a lot of nice people in Blackwood Bay and lots of very n unpleasant things happen there. And uh, I thought it would be really horrible and ironic if I, if I was to set a book in a real place and then that I loved, because I do love Robin Hood's Bay, and then they would <laughs> sort of drum me out of town and never let me go back, because um, I was horrible. Um, and, you know, and no matter how many disclaimers you put at the beginning of the book about how this isn't based on real people you know it's always going to be it's too small a place as well you know I, I i was i was scared of accidentally describing a real person who lived there you know um reminds me of a story i, I met i met a, a writer on a on tour once who told me the story about how she had got her book her book was about to be published as it was in the stores it wasn't publication day yet so it was still in the boxes you know with you know, ready to be ripped open and put on the shelf. Uh, but she'd sent a copy, a proof copy, I think, to her friend. And her friend had said, like on the eve of publication, pretty much, had said, oh, I read your book and I really love it, but is there any reason why you gave the child, the serial child rapist, the same name as that kid we went to school with? <gasps> and it wasn't, it wasn't a very, it wasn't an ordinary name. It was quite an unusual name. And it was a subconscious, oh, no. just actually, she just subconsciously picked this name. So they'd had to pulp the entire print one because they obviously couldn't put that out. So I think I was kind of, <laughs> that story obviously struck with me accidentally describing a real person. So I set it very in a fictional place. But yeah, I very much wanted this book. Unlike my first two, I think with my first two, with Before I Go to Sleep and Second Life, they're very sort of, the drama is very internal. It's very, uh, it's about the home and it's about these internal family dynamics. Mm. And I think with this book, I did really want to make the setting much more important. And I've always really loved those books. Like Rebecca always comes to mind when I think about these books, but there are obviously many more of them, but those books in which the landscape and the setting is, is really part of it and does feel like another character almost. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really, I'm really pleased that you felt that because that was something I was definitely going for, that feel of drama. And I mean, Robin Hood's Bay is a very, it's a very unusual place in some ways. It's kind of tucked away on the coast and uh, obviously, and it, you know, you have to tra travel over the moors for about an hour or something to, to, just to get there. So you drive through this kind of strange, not strange, but this kind of very desolate landscape where there's just sheep and heather basically, <laughs> and it's flat. And then as you draw near, there's this very strange looking, um, it, it's, it's presumably it's an RAF thing, it's something military anyway, that kind of, just looms in the distance with this huge, I presume it's a radar something, but it looks like like an alien spacecraft almost. <laughs> so it's very odd. And then you get to Robin's Bay itself. <clears throat> and like in like Blackwood Bay in the book, there are, there are no real, there are no cars down there because it's too steep and narrow and the street's very narrow. So you kind of get lost in, in these winding, tiny winding alleyways and you disappear at one and you never know whether you're going to be you're going to emerge to a courtyard with, with, I don't know, several houses or a church or a graveyard or a dead end. It's very, I, I, and I really love that about it. Now you've, you've described the setting so well. I mean, I, it really makes me want to visit, uh, <laughs> visit the real I mean, location. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, yeah, go to Robin's Bay, it's lovely. I've always yeah. been in winter as well, which I think adds to the atmosphere. Definitely. It might be completely different in summer. It might, it might be, yeah, but. 
And uh, so we, we were talking earlier um, in the show about um, the, the topic that we were discussing today, which is the enduring popularity of the psychological thriller. Right, and yeah. we kind of, you know, had a few thoughts on why we think it's so popular. I mean, what, what, what are your thoughts on why it's such a um, popular genre? Why, why so many people love reading the kind of books that we write? I, I think people... I don't, I don't, I try not to think about this too much, actually, because then I think you, you start to do it on purpose, don't you? And then, mm. and then it sort of di dilutes it somehow. But I think people enjoy the, pa I mean, it, you know, it's such a cliche, but the, the whole page turner aspect of it and there being surprises and, and being wrong footed, mm. you know, I mean, crime, there's a, there's an element with all crime novels, isn't there, of, of, of sort of a mystery, a, 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 a big question mark that you're, and, and of course, the contract that we have with the reader is that I'm going to I'm going to dangle possibilities, and and but you but I'm not going to make it impossible for you to guess. You know, it, it's not it's oh, and I, and I'm also going to tell you the truth at the end, whether that be who's killed, you know, who's responsible for the body in the library or or, or whatever it might be. But you are you are going to get an answer. But I'm going to I'm going to make the journey exciting. And also, I think there's that sense of it being like a puzzle. You're almost sort of when you're reading one of these books, I think you're almost kind of trying to work out what is the twist going to be, what's the sort of who is who is is this person really who they say they are? Do they mean that when they said that? You know, is this is this a red herring or have I just worked something out? So I think it's that kind of almost I don't know, and also very high stakes. You know, usually usually we're looking at murder or, or people being people whose lives have been turned upside down in some way, mm. not ended. Um, so yeah, I think. We were saying earlier how, you know, it's sort of um, often because it's the sort of a domestic setting or a setting that we're familiar with, we, we can kind of really closely identify with those characters yeah. and we kind of live yeah. vicariously through them. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, there, I think maybe people like being scared in terms of, I mean, I've nothing, I've nothing against those books that, you know, things like Silence of the Lambs and stuff, mm. you know. Or, or serial killers running around with ski masks on or whatever. But I think there is something about a book about ordinary people doing bad things to each other or, mm. you know, the evil that lurks, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the home environment, which I think people enjoy that kind of sense of identification maybe or, mm. yeah. Um, but it's yeah. it's it's been a popular genre since well since Rebecca really or maybe even before but I mean that was in the mm. 30s wasn't it that that was yeah. really, so and, yeah. you know they were a very popular genre yeah. so we, we were just say, saying earlier how we hope it continues to be a popular genre oh, yeah. <laughs> we really need it too yeah. I think I think the other thing as well is is, is uh, I think with crime I mean all crime genres not just psychological thrillers not just domestic thrillers as well mm -hmm. we can talk about uh, contemporary life um, and yeah, social issues and things. So, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah, social issues. And, 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 but in an entertaining way, I think, you know, I, I have no, I, I, I love it when people say they think my books are well written. That's what I'm trying to do, obviously. But I also think, first and foremost, I want to entertain people. I want, I want to sort of transport people and, and, um, yeah, it, when they say, "Oh, I read that in two days," I mean, part of me thinks it took me years to write that. Really, but but there is a bit of, bit of me that thinks I love it when people say, "Oh, you know, I, I forgot to feed my children," or yeah. You know, but that's exactly why you're writing, isn't it? To get people yeah. to turn the pages. Yeah. yeah, and you certainly got us turning the pages. I'll tell you that. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and did you um you talked about um like a serial killers and there are quite a few cliches within the genre now that are rising up to the, the missing child and, and those sort of things. Mm. Do you ever feel constrained by um, some of the troops that are in um, psychological thrillers or do you still feel like there's sort of a place to go with the genre? Um, I mean, I have to believe there are places to go with it because otherwise why would you bother? <laughs> but I think it is difficult. I think, I mean, there's a big, con well, not, not a big controversy. There was a controversy a little while ago, wasn't there, about um, how many women get murdered or raped in these sorts of books yeah. and the difficulty there. And I am very aware of that, that, prob that kind of problem. I mean, on the one hand, I think by pretending those things don't happen, I don't think we help anybody. 
you know, by brushing that, that horrible stuff onto the carpet. I don't think that's helpful. Um, but it's difficult because, you know, I was talking, it's interesting, I was talking to Tess Gerritsen about, about this kind of thing, and she's far more experienced than me, and has got far more novels under her belt, and, you know, been in the game for much longer than I have. And she was saying, you know, that one of the difficulties is, if, if you have a, a serial killer killing men, for example, no one really cares. People don't want to read that sort of stuff. Mm. Um, Gosh, that's a sad indictment, isn't yeah, it? I mean, it's... <laughs> Mm. But you can't or maybe, kill people. Or maybe it's because most, of, most, maybe it's because the people who read this kind of the genre are predominantly women, and they would rather read about that. Maybe it is something about that sense of fear or something. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I agree. But I can't. Um, you can't get. Uh, you can't kill an animal in the books, can you? Mm. Like, it's like a massive no-no. And if men are boring, then that only really leaves women and children, really, doesn't it? So you know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a real tricky one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. And, you know, and I suppose it's that, it's that, um, I suppose really it's, I mean, in all my books, I, you know, I don't, I try to create even the victim. I mean, again, I don't want to talk too much about it because it gives stuff away, but I think I, I would, I don't like it when there's a book in which the women are only there to be pretty and to be dead or raped mm, mm. that's that's really sort of distasteful i think yeah um no i agree women we, yeah. female characters they've got to have some agency haven't they they've yeah. got to they've got to you know not be some helpless female um otherwise yeah, that just plays to, into it doesn't it yeah yeah they don't have to be bad they don't have to be good even they don't have to be pure that's mm. you know we're not are we uh, well, that's, like, I mean, that's what i loved I about gone girl i thought gone girl was great because it's like She's such a, de a despicable character, and yet you kind of yeah. love her as well. Yeah, you still um, for her, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, Steve, memory plays a huge part in, well, at least, well, all of your novels, but particularly mm -hmm. the first and the, and, and, and the third. And we were wondering, um, what is the most important or worst thing that you've ever forgotten? Oh, gosh. I've ever <laughs> forgotten. I don't know because I've forgotten it. So, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, we've we've got a couple of things that we could talk about, but we. But, I mean, I we mean, you know, I've almost I've, I almost forgot that I'd. I don't know really, actually. I've ne I've never sort of forgotten. I've left the iron on and burnt the house down or anything like that. I'm quite obsessive. You're quite what obsessive. I'm quite obsessive, yeah. So I'm I am the person who has to stop. I have to stop myself from going back to check I've left the iron off, turn the iron off. Even when I haven't ironed anything. Yeah. I, I forgot something huge once. Well, it was actually something quite small, but hugely important. Um, it was when I had my first baby, my son Jack, and um, it was the first time I'd left the house with him in the pram since my husband and my ex-husband <laughs> had gone um, um, on, um, you know, he'd finished his paternity leave or whatever it was called. And uh, so I was on my own in the house, decided I needed to go to the post office, got the pram ready and it takes ages to leave the house after you've had a baby because you're so panicking, you know, about have you got everything with you? Finally got everything ready, this big bassinet pram, walked down the road, went to the post office, I didn't want to leave him outside the post office because there'd been all sorts of things in the news about babies being snatched. So I wheeled him in there, left him at the, you know, by the counter, went and did my bits, got put my stamps and what have you, and went home. And then oh, no. I got home, put my key in the door, and I thought, oh, something's not quite right. Have I got my handbag? And then I thought, oh my God, I've left him in the post office. <laughs> I ran, honestly, I, I ran so fast. I ran like a cheetah down yeah. the road. <laughs> I, by the time I got there, I was sweating. I was I was in a real state, but he was fast asleep in his pram, fine. And the post office people had hardly <laughs> noticed because they'd all got a queue. I mean, he survived. He survived my dreadful mothering. He's thirty-two <laughs> now. So, <laughs> what about you, Laurie? Have you forgotten anything dreadful? My mine is similar in that um, I took my children to preschool, which is only across the road. And I took the dog with me so just to get a bit of fresh air. And I tied him up outside and um, just took the kids in, went home, had a coffee, was cleaning the house. I was like, oh, it's so quiet without the kids. I was like, and the dog. And I <laughs> him tied up for about two hours just outside the preschool. And he didn't bark or anything. He was just sat there thinking, what have you done, lady? Um, so yeah, another 
forgetting of someone we love, I think, um, seems to be a common theme for us, Leslie. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not doing like that. I've done lots and lots of like s silly little things. Like, <laughs> the one that nearly had devastating consequences when I was I once, uh, I hoover. <laughs> I hoovered over, this is years ago, I hoovered over my, um, the, the, the lead from the, from the vacuum cleaner and, and, it, and it blew up because it oh. basically sucked it in and then, um, <laughs> you know, and so it didn't blow up, but it kind of like fused with a big dramatic kind of like, I think there was a flash. I thought, oh, but I, you know, I thought, I've got a physics degree. I, I can rewire a plug. I can do this. So <laughs> I got my uh, wire cutters to cut the wire off because I'd got another, I must have had a spare lead I was going to, and I can't quite remember the details, but anyway, I was going to cut the wire off. I hadn't unplugged it first. Though. <gasps> oh. so I just cut through and then there was a big bang. Uh, so yeah, forgot to unplug a lead I was about to cut through with metal, metal, um, wire cutters was probably that could have been, been fatal that could have been that could have been, could fatal. Have been pretty bad yeah. that would have been robbed of the legendary sj watson the legendary <laughs> sj watson exactly <laughs> yeah well, well we've got um, just a few quick fire questions for you now um so you just have to answer the first thing that comes into your head right. think about it, okay so really simple ones not going to put you too much on the spot think whenever, whenever anyone says answer the first thing that comes into your i always i can only think of swear words <laughs> That's okay. So I'll try not to. I'll, yeah. All right. So the first one is tea or coffee? Oh gosh, coffee. Paperback or ebook? Paperback. Pen or keyboard? Pen. Desk or sofa? Oh, sofa. Wood, woodland or beach? Beach. Summer or winter? Winter. Cat or dog? Dog. <laughs> and finally, and I'm not asking about on a date here, crowded bar or dinner for two? Both. Can I have both? Kind of both. Yeah, both. Both, yeah. Well, well, well done. Done. You did very well. <laughs> yeah, I'm well glad done, you said Steve. dog because Rodney is sat behind me and he would have been quite upset. Well, Lola is down here, so she would have also. She <laughs> but I was slightly worried earlier you could hear her snoring. But. <laughs> Well, we really feel that we've got to know you a little bit better now, Steve. The man behind the legend, <laughs> the legendary S.J. Watson. Thank you so much for being our Thank very you. first guest. Um, you've been absolutely fabulous. We've, well, we've you. loved Thank you. having Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to be your first guest. You're, 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 you're guinea pig. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, you know, we, we, we're... we're we're going to get ready now for our next episode and that's going to be in two weeks time and the topic for that one will be gosh what will it be it will be the importance of supporting other writers mm. and um we'll well i'll talk about the the guest who's coming on in a minute but um before i do that um don't forget we've got a twitter account which is at in suspense pod is that correct laurie yes yes it is. and um yeah, do subscribe to our to our video channel. I think we've only got six subscribers. We've had loads of downloads, but I mean, Steve's got loads of subscribers. So if we could have some of yours, Steve, that would be yeah, fabulous. I'd borrow them. Send them on, yeah. Yeah, just <laughs> press the subscribe button. You know, don't make us beg, please, because it's it's humiliating. I oh, know you um, have to. Beg. I've only got those by begging. I mean. I'm <laughs> But yeah, so our next next uh, episode's topic is the importance of supporting other writers. And we've got a guest coming on who will know all about that. Um, but of course, we are not going to tell you who that is yet because we are going to keep you in, in, in suspense. <laughs> Thank you. That's, it just gets cheesier every it's time. It's a bit cheesy. Them. It's a bit naff. But then that's us, I'm afraid. That's, 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 that's us. Thanks so much, Steve. Really, really enjoyed having you on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cheers. Bye. Bye.